Command of Blood is a point-and-click FMV adventure game developed by Cryo and published by Mindscape in 1994. French people are strange even to their romance-speaking neighbours, retaining some sort of Gaulish tendency towards whimsy and flights of fancy. I am reminded of a quote by French 19th century poet Gérard de Naval who was said to have walked a pet lobster through the streets of Paris and when asked replied with something along the lines of, it does not bark and it knows the secrets of the deep. I think that's based, but others might think that's silly or pretentious. To walk a lobster both rejects social convention and accepts it in a proud French tradition of dancing on the edges of possibility and imagination. Command of Blood is the sequel to Captain Blood, a 1988 multi-platform game first releasing on Atari ST, and notable enough to warrant its own introduction for its genre-defying gameplay. Captain Blood would have you travelling across space and communicating with various alien races, each with their own manner of speaking, through a logogram-based communication system. You can teleport these aliens aboard your ship, fly through canyons and blow up planets, while rushing across a procedurally generated galaxy to recover the vital essences trapped in various clones before your body fully deteriorates. The intro song is also a cover of Ethnicolor by Jean-Michel Jarre. Captain Blood was a massive success and helped propel French developers Philippe Ulrich and Didier Bouchon into the spotlight which they accepted with a typically French flair for theatrics when on June 1988, Philip Ulrich gave a press announcement at Air Informatique Studios to announce a new label and a new god. Ulrich declared he would reveal the secrets of Air Informatique's success and pleaded for sensitive people in the room to remain strong before revealing to the press their otherworldly muse. I'll quote from this speech, so if any women in labor are present, Please be forewarned. It is him, Ulrich declared, him who has been in our offices for months. He who comes from outside the universe. He that will reveal today to the world because the hour has come. I name Exos. I ask you to say after me some magic sentences which point out his country to him. Ata hata hoglo hulu. Atta atta hoglo hulu. This chant of atta atta hoglo hulu and the marketing slogan Exos is good for you became an indelible part of French gaming culture. The Exos label would go on to create numerous unique and original sci fi titles for a brief period of time until 1989 when many of its key staff left to form Cryo Interactive, including lead developers Philippe Ulrich and Didier Bouchon. With the same Didier Bouchon at the helm as the lead developer, it's worth questioning the differences between the visual and gameplay design from its predecessor. Where Captain Blood seemed to defy genres, Commander Blood roots itself as a point and click adventure. Gone is the unmistakable biomechanical influences of the original Captain Blood in favour of a more sleek and new age look, with a purple undulating cockpit with big bright buttons, and a cast of puppets and costumes from the cute to the depraved. Though you still sit in a cockpit with some minor functionality from the original game, you can no longer destroy planets and the interactive canyon flying sequences have been ditched. This seems like a massive step backwards, but as incredible as the 1988 original game seems to me now, I have to remind myself that Elite had already introduced the world to open world space sims in 1984, and the canyon flight sequences of Captain Blood or a brief repetitive obstacle you had to overcome before initiating any dialogue with a new alien. The upcom dialogue system, the main feature of the game, which to me feels revolutionary now, in some ways might be rationalised as a simplification of the text parser of the old text adventure games, which branching dialogue trees had long since superseded. And with characters now made essential by a more focused plot, destroying planets would not have been viable. With all that in mind, it should be no surprise that the sequel, releasing when it did, plays as a more traditional FMV adventure game. In all honesty, before I started I knew very little about this series, I was just drawn in by the absurd intro cutscene. Who are these aliens? 
What's he blasting? Who is that aquatic vixen? It's also very French. Let's delve into the mechanics. You start the game after a life-changing opening cinematic intro song. A mouse click closes the on-screen display. An insistent electronic ringing fills the air and forces you to swivel 360 degrees in an effort to find the source of the commotion. By luck or process of elimination, you eventually hit a large button and receive a message from an alien explaining your next steps if you hadn't already worked everything out by yourself. Selecting the word honk does not sound the space horn, as I had initially thought, but is actually the name of your ship's AI who provides you with guidance or hints. The cryo box is the ship's cargo which encompasses traditional inventory space in addition to storing, as in the original game, friendly aliens and robots. Ferrying about creatures like an intergalactic taxi driver or cracking open the refrigerator and throwing out a friend to chat with, or use like a Swiss army knife, is a major part of the game, and what passes for what you might call puzzles. Of the other selectable items, a telephone is a scarcely used option to call someone when required for certain puzzles, and the menu displays the ship's menu, usually something made out of merflow meat, and I think is intended as something of a joke. The dolphin is a sort of drone, an alien named an orcs, your method of communicating with the world. In the original Captain Blood manual, Bob Morlock, the original Captain Blood, saved the orc's mother from extinction and then committed medical atrocities on it by genetically engineering it to infinitely breed these dolphin slaves, much against the protesting of Honk. As such, even if you are attacked by an alien, only one of the infinite orc's children are destroyed and there are no failure states or even setbacks. Puzzles too are trivial at best, or when they don't appear to follow any sense of logic, Progression can be brute forced by revisiting locations, sometimes counterintuitively immediately after leaving them. Other times, thawing out one of your passages from the cryo box will allow you to stumble upon the answer. There are also random hints in the form of radio messages and a hint system powered by its own little minigame, in which you bother a certain robot passenger and then try to grab a little fish and deposit them on a stingray before it can be knocked out of your hand. As interesting as this might look, it's actually so mediocre and unnecessary it was patched out of the European version of the game. You can skip ahead to the timestamp below to hear my thoughts on the story, or hold tight for a full spoiler reveal. I'll also be spoiling the ending of the previous game. The original Captain Blood chronicled the adventures of Bob Morlock programmer trapped in the expansive realm of his own video game and his efforts to find and terminate his clones before being crippled by the loss of his life force. The game ended with you settling down with a naked Ondion sitting in your cockpit, an Ondion being a sort of alien that always looks like the most attractive mate of the observer's species, so I'll let you use your disgusting pixelated imaginations, largely because I couldn't be bothered doing a playthrough for the footage. Commander Blood takes place long after these events. Bob Moloch is now over 800,000 years old, a man of culture who has lived a rich and fulfilling life, a lover, a fighter, a man of letters, and a creator, an artist, an entrepreneur, having founded a vast company, Canary, and amassing a fortune through his army of cloned employees, with no little effort at part of that fortune going to keeping Bob alive. Bob Morlock is so old that he's kept on ice and only woken up periodically for minutes at a time to celebrate his birthday. Feeling his end drawing nigh and afflicted with a crippling sense of ennui, he directs his resources to one final goal, to travel through time and bear witness to the Big Bang. Commander Blood's manual presents us with the cold hard science on the matter, quoting, the finest minds available to Canary have calculated that the sensations provided by witnessing the Big Bang probably score 17 on the Crump Neuroscale, which normally stops at 9. In layman's terms, it's the equivalent of 1,976,574.33 simultaneous orgasms, or 45,653,543 billion spubs a kind of off-world peanut 
swallowed at the same time by one individual. Do not try this at home. And so canary scientists have discovered or created a sort of special black hole called Oddland that once found can be used to take one back in time. In fact, the whole specifics of it are quite vague, but the goal is straightforward, which is to go a voyaging across space and eventually time. This is the situation as you flick off the television in the cockpit of the Ark, as a call informs you Captain Bob awaits in the cryo box to brief you on your mission. The ancient legend speaks authoritatively and carefully, if a little longingly about the black hole, and dubs you Commander Blood before his exertions return him to the cryo box. Your first act as Commander Blood is to launch an Aux to begin exploration of the planet Corpo which awaits before you on the ship's screen. In the original Captain Blood, one of the first potential aliens you could encounter was the small Iswal. Coincidentally, an Iswal stands before you, cowering in fear and after your reassurances, he introduces himself as Iswalito. He reveals that he and his family is starving and hands you a credit, entreating you to buy Murflo meat for him from the planet Mosquito. Honk, the ship AI who is a bit of a space racist, protests in your ear, calling Iswalito a rat. On the planet Mosquito, the robot named Bronco informs you that he has too much meat to chop to deal with you for now, leaving you with no recourse but to kill time or try to find another way. An advertisement over the ship radio tells you of the supermarket of Venusia, where one can purchase anything, including, you find out, Murflo meat. With Murflo meat in tow, you return to Iswalido only to find out that it's too expensive and small and they are very liable to die of starvation still somehow. Hong chimes in with his racist confirmation bias. But look at these adorable little critters. You leap from planet to planet picking up a discarded robot called Morning Oil and enlisting a scooter called Joe by giving him a code either heard in a random radio message or guessed at through gaming trivia. Scooters can generate biox which can be turned into bionium, universal power source for robots, but specifically used by Honk to process hints. Time is ticking away however, and as you dash around the universe, little his Walido becomes increasingly more desperate. In a stunning example of puzzle logic, on returning to the supermarket, a place you would have no reason to visit on account of not having any creds, you happen to win one out of nowhere. How very serendipitous. The precious cred on board, you don't stop to browse the wares, you immediately return to Murflo where thankfully the butcher Bronco now has time to give you the precious meat. It's all water under the bridge for the little Iswalido, and he gratefully gives you a television receiver and introduces you to another new friend. Hom, the tubular brain, who thanks you for helping the Iswal and invites you to his planet. Iswalido also directs you to the planet Rondo, and there we meet some more Iswals including old Maxim, who needs a lens for his telescope. Elsewhere, orbiting the nearby planet of Hexatomb, you meet a wholesome family of cute little slimers. Look at these cute little kids, gelatin, rubber, gooseberry and latex. After some insistence, you were told of a friend throwing away his savings trying to make himself younger and at a clinic on a razor. And you were warned never to go there. So you immediately go there and meet with Dr. Otto von Smile, a surgeon who happens to be in possession of a lens. Probably not the lens Maxon was expecting, but it will do. You bargain him down from the initial impossible sale price of 2000 creds in return for revealing the coordinates to Exitum which I'm not sure how he didn't know since, you know, the Slimer's friend could have told him. But his drones confirm your information and you return to Rondo with a lens. You check in on the repairs to one of your robots, Morning Oil, and learn that he was once the possession of the dangerous criminal, the cruelest Eviscerator, whose treasure remains undiscovered. He gives you the coordinates to Eviscerator's prison. After bribing the scooter guarding the door with some murder oil perfume, you meet with Eviscerator who is willing to reveal the location of the treasure 
if you retrieve some splatch, a powerful explosive capable busting him out. He directs you to his friends at the Purple Haze on Planet Eden. There you meet the ravishing beauty Tina Burner. So now you know, gentlemen of culture, why you're here. But I hope you stick around. After uniting Tina Burner with the musician Migrator, you are finally able to secure the Splatch and get Eviscerator out of jail. In exchange, she tells you his treasure is on a planet called Tumul, and away you go. On Tumul, we find an ancient temple and a canary employee named Beauregard burnt to a crisp when the sun exploded. Beauregard's got my favourite animations, constantly glaring with red eyes like some old horror flick of early cinema, though as a canary employee he's obviously a damaged clone of Bob Morlock. As you search for some sort of replacement body, the consequences of your actions begin to catch up with you. You receive radio calls from the Iswali that Maxon has been kidnapped by a viscerator who is demanding a ransom. Passing through the slime town, you also learn that the slime of children, gelatin, rubber, gooseberry, and yes, even latex has also gone missing, and Dr. Otto von Smile is nowhere to be seen. You also check in with Hom on his home planet. And he asks you to take a test to join the guild and become a dork, a doctor of rare knowledge. This is essentially a quiz of in-universe trivia that continues until you get enough answers right. On a planet on which you've discovered several other junked bots, you find a white scooter still smelling faintly of motor oil perfume, which would make a perfect body for Beauregard. You assist Beauregard in breaking further into the temple, but the true treasure turns out to be Beauregard's very base love of history and the friends we make along the way, of course. But actually, it's the mummy of the ancient king Betacam IV, which brings about a curse. Around here, I started to enjoy Commander Blood and the way it had established itself as its own game. Cheeky and light-hearted, picaresque adventure story across this real world, peopled by Muppet-like cast of characters, occasionally punctuated by outbursts of French randiness. Not necessarily a good game, but one that definitely makes an impression, and I was interested in how the manic adventure would end. At this point in the game, you are contacted by an Inspector Jerry Khan, disturbed by all the problems that appear to have somehow sprung up everywhere. I uh, particularly like how he moonwalks across the screen. Together you trace Eviscerator as having gone through one of the black holes you have been searching for, Oddland, which sends you back in time, although still not as far back as the Big Bang. You travel from planet to planet, marvelling how much the planets have changed. You meet the Tromps, another adorable alien race, and exchange your cursed television receiver for a photo of the beautiful Andoyant, and the photo seemingly retains their legendary seductive glamour that affects any who look upon them. You meet with Hom from the past and present your door credentials, and he's beside himself, permitting himself to be teleported aboard to find out more. Inspector Jerry will check in with you as you follow various leads until you are able to locate a Jawa looking sorcerer, Gar, who, in exchange for yet another favour, telepathically works with the startled living King Bidicam IV to break the curse. Bidicam, of course, insists to meet with the owner of his corpse. So, after explaining your story, you agree to find a planet whose sun won't kill its people. You track Eviscerator to a robot factory and meet with his henchmen, where it's revealed Eviscerator's treasure was hidden inside Betacam's mummy the entire time. Whether this mummy was smuggling fine arts or hard drugs, we'll never find out, as we have no other recourse but to hand it over and leave. But before you leave the system, you receive a transmission. It's the man himself, Eviscerator, who says they are cursed and suffering from nightmares and sickness. He divulges to you Maxon's location, and we go immediately to the rescue. I 
love the cute little space sprit and Maxon shivering or struggling against his chains, and the fact his trunk has a manacle around it like he might actually be capable of doing something with it. After that, Inspector Jerry cleans up. The organization is destroyed and a nearby abandoned cooler space makes a perfect place for Beta Camp to relocate. After a few more favors, you travel to a planet and meet with one of the near legendary Ondeyants. She states she's been waiting billions of years for you, and you very gently teleport her on board. You return through the black hole and back to the present. Your robot Morning Oil succeeds in rescuing the Slimer kids and you drop off the Iswals while Jerry Khan pursues Dr. Otto von Smile. Hom's tubular brain also can't handle all the nonsense up until this point and leaves. You revisit various locations for leads and are surprised that the planet where you saved both Beauregard and Betacam is now a bustling pilgrimage site, marking the location of your miraculous appearance in the past. Elsewhere, everyone talks about being in a hurry for a big party at the Big Bang, but are too busy to say where that might be. When you revisit Hom, his tubular brain forgets all about you, and you need to again sit through another trivia test to receive another degree. Eventually, his big brain provides you with the answer, and you reach the Big Bang only to find out that your translation software, Olga, was broken and everyone was talking about the big band the whole time, infuriating Captain Moore, who lets the minutes ravage his aging body outside of the cryo box for extended periods of time, just so he can berate everyone. The party turns out to be the wedding of Migrator and Tina Burner, and since you were responsible for playing matchmaker, you are the best man and need to find a ring. Thankfully, the Ondeyant just so happens to have one and loves you enough to give it to you freely. How very serendipitous. After some banter, there's a brief mention that the Big Bang still hasn't been reached, and the wedding kicks off with a bombastic, surprisingly German musical performance. And then the game ends with your goal unobtained. The most obvious reason is that the game went over budget and had to be rushed. The opening intro cinematic includes some scenes not featured in the game, and the game data was mined to find 9 extra planet sequences and 29 extra miscellaneous rendered sequences. A lot of this would be reused with the release of a 1996 sequel called Big Bug Bang, Le Retour de Commander Blood, which never saw an English release. It seems to be a relatively short game with the same mechanics as Command of Blood, it involves repopulating the universe at the start of the Big Bang. The story told, how do I feel about it after finishing the game? How do I evaluate this? I like to take the approach of putting aside my expectations and trying to judge a thing on its own merits. The lack of a real ending is a massive disappointment to anyone. But though curtailed, the journey along the way really grew on me. I enjoyed the unique cast of characters, the locations, and the corny general audience family humour, while barely suppressed French horniness and manic energy lurked at the periphery. The gameplay and puzzles aren't the most enthralling, but leaving this aside, I still can appreciate the game with the same sort of fondness as an offbeat childhood TV show that dares to do something a little different. Ambitious and interesting projects that underachieve might be something of a common theme in Cryo Interactive's catalogue. And in their time, they developed various games based on high concept sci fi settings from writers such as Philip K. Dick, Philip Jose Farmer, Frank Herbert, and even Gustave Flaubert. I began this review by discussing a French tendency towards whimsy and imagination. I'd like to recommend for this episode The Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Forstral, Pataphysician by Alfred Jarry. Pataphysics, sometimes spelt with a rebellious apostrophe in front of it, is described as the science of imaginary solutions, and many of the book's events dance on the edge of reality and fiction. After having almost all of his property seized for not paying rent, Dr. Fostrel flees Paris, 
beginning by conjuring a mix of real and abstract items from his book collection, then sets off in a colander coated in a layer of wax, so that the holes maintain surface cohesion and water that enters the makeshift boat passes through the holes and goes through the other side. But the so-called skiff also uses oars, rollers and springs to propel itself over land. The doctor is joined by Bors de Nage, a baboon whose bright fleshy posterior he had transferred to the monkey's cheeks, and acts as a porter to hold the colander onto the pavement and to say ha ha whenever any dialogue went over long. The language is meticulously ornate in its descriptions of fantastical scenarios that blend reality and imagination. A very interesting but difficult read. The style of Commander Blood also calls to mind the colourful worlds and distinctive art of French comic books, dominated as it was by the influence of the artist Mobius, who is behind my next recommendation, Upon a Star. Originally created as promotional material for French comic Citroën, the art is less detailed than Mobius's later work but still beautifully and elegantly expresses a simple love of adventure. The Surreal Muppet Show is a big reason why I love this game. The Trump and Iswell designs are eminently smooshable and squishable and cute. The Micrax are wonderfully repulsive, a visual joke themselves. And the Cruelists are, well, their actors are probably dead of heat exhaustion, so let's be respectful. The visuals come with some degree of Eurojank, where sometimes when they stop talking, their idle animations place their bodies in a different frame than when they were speaking, making it look like there are two aliens taking part in one conversation. Or sometimes they really are signaling more than one alien, I really can't tell. Otherwise the game looks great. The animation of the orcs launching itself from the gestation tube is slick and brief enough to not overstay its welcome, and the planets and transition scenes are vibrant and rich in character. Some slick Eurobeats do well to capture the mood of the planets and creatures you meet, and there's a surprising amount of tracks. The music is by Philippe Ecre and Stéphane Pic. Pic was also responsible for sound effects and had been creating tracks since the days of Exos in 1989, including the highly regarded soundtrack for the 1992 Dune Adventure game, which was recently remastered with help of Philip Ulrich. The god Exos still lives this time as the muse of a music label. Alien voices are limited to babble, which, as far as I can tell from the credits, was performed by random cryo staff. How do I feel about Commander Blood? It's an interesting title that ultimately leaves me unfulfilled. Just as I grew to appreciate the characters and look past the goofiness enough to hope for some sort of resolution, I was denied. Commander Blood is like a burgeoning childhood friendship cut short because one of you had to go to a different school. Also maybe the kid's parents drank a little too much wine and the kid doesn't always make a whole lot of sense and is a little immature even for its age. But your friends still kind of cool and artistic and into the same interests and you like chatting. Too bad, they've gone to a different school and you'll never speak to them again. And also they speak exclusively French now, ha ha ha, sucker, because the ending is in another game, in French. That's Commander Blood, an unfortunate end from a celebrated beginning, but not without some charm and some fun along the way. <laughs> <laughs> 